That was beautiful, wasn't it? Beautiful time of year, beautiful family, reminding us of the baby in the manger, the Christ in in the manger. Sorry, my computer was on, and as I stood up, it went off, and now it's not. Come on, there we go. I might have to do this without my notes. I might have to rely on the Holy Spirit. (laughs) Every time the screen comes on, it shuts back off. All right, it is currently on. 
Okay, lessons from the birth of Jesus. You know, you've all heard the old saying, he is the reason for the season, right? And there's lots going on. A lot of people were, you know, a lot of family we're going to see and presents to give and decorations and all these things that are beautiful in their own right, but can also be distractions from the reason that we remember this time of year uh, as the memorial of the death, of the, as the birth of Jesus. But there are many lessons for us, practical lessons, life lessons, things that can give us strength and understanding, and, and especially towards these end times in which we live. So why don't we have a word of prayer and we will study. Father, we thank you so much that Jesus did come into this world. And so, Father, help us to reflect upon that, uh, not just now, not just today, not just on the 25th, but throughout, of our li- throughout every day of our lives. Help us to remember, Lord, why he came, what he did, what he accomplished, and what now you want us to do. So help us as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've mentioned before that outside of the final week, the Passion Week of Jesus, from the triumphal entry, triumphant entry into the resurrection, outside of that week, only one story from the life of Jesus is shared in all four Gospels. And it's not actually the birth of Jesus. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's the only story for the, you know, 30 plus years of Jesus' life that is shared in all four, all four Gospels. But the birth, the nativity story is, though not shared in all four, is incredibly important because it's the reminder to us that Jesus, eternal God, always had been, always will be, the King of kings, the creator of the earth, the creator of the universe, that all things came, that all things that exist came from him, that he left it all behind to be born here as one of us. Yes, divine, but also man with us. Here he was with us. It's such an important story. We need to, I, I, you know, it's important to remember once a year, but it's the heart, it's the beginning of his whole ministry. And it says a lot about what he would accomplish, what he would do, what he was here for, who he was, the character that he had, the love that he was demonstrating. This story from the very beginning shares so much with us. And certainly some churches put too much focus on Mary's role in the story. And maybe as Adventists, because of that, we react the opposite way and don't put enough uh, emphasis on who she was. I mean, she did raise Jesus to, to, to be the Savior that he was. But I often ponder, what about Joseph? What about Joseph? The, the Bible doesn't say as much about him as it does about Mary. We don't often talk about Joseph. We know that Jesus was the carpenter's son. It's one of the few things that we learn about him. Joseph is almost a side character at times, right? There's Jesus, there's Mary, and then there's Joseph over here. But there's an important part of the birth story that actually is a part of Joseph's story. And I want to start there. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. For some of us, that might inflame us, that he took her like a possession, and he hid her. He put her behind. He put her away, right? He, he hid her from things. But I don't think so much that it was him trying to be a bad guy or embarrassed by her. He was trying to protect her. It says there that he didn't want to make her a public example. He was scared of what people would think, what people would accuse her of. And he knew these things weren't true, so he put her away secretly. But what happens next? How would Joseph react? Let's keep reading. Verse 20, but while he thought about these things, behold, 
an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I can't imagine being in his shoes, being engaged to someone and having that someone come to me and say, I'm pregnant and I didn't sleep with anyone, right? I can't imagine that. Yeah, right. <laughs> that fear, that angst, the confusion, maybe the hurt. And so he does not react harshly. He does not throw her aside. He does not, you know, break off the engagement. In fact, did you notice that it says that they were engaged? But then it fast forwards a bit in the story and says, then Joseph, her husband. So that before Jesus was born, they had gotten married. He had followed through. Even before this message from the angel, he follows through and he marries her. And then he puts her away so that others could not judge her harshly. And so we find a character, a godly character, not just in Mary, but also in Joseph. But there is still some fear, some trepidation in him, some confusion, some wondering, right? This Is she telling me the truth? He seems to have acted as if he believes it and he's taken the right steps. But there still seems to be a question in his heart because God has to send Gabriel again. Not just to Mary, but to Joseph, and tell him himself, she's telling you the truth. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, he didn't hide her in, in punishment or in judgment, but in protection for her. But Gabriel has an interesting part here, an interesting statement here that I don't want us to miss. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary your wife. Don't be afraid to bring her back out of hiding. Don't be afraid to show the public that she is your wife, that you believe her. God wanted there to be a complete home, a happy home, not a separated home, but a happy home for Jesus to be raised in. This part of the story gives us so many different lessons here that connect with our stories today. Number one, the role of the father slash husband is to protect the home, but specifically the relationships of the home, right? The father is, you know, it's, you know, the manly thing to want to protect the home, you know, to make sure the doors are locked, the windows are shut at night, to make sure that the security system's working, that lights are on outside when we go to sleep, to make sure that everyone's safe and secure. But often us fathers and husbands forget that our job is to also protect not just the physical safety of the family, but the relational safety of the family. To protect the spiritual safety of the family. As a priest of the home, our job is not just to make sure that everyone has full bellies and are safe from the bad guys, but that people are walking with Jesus as well. And grandfathers and great-grandfathers, don't forget that's still a part of your role as well. We don't retire. We might retire from Work and occupations, we don't retire from this job of protecting the relational family unit. Ellen White calls it the sacred family circle. And that is sacred not just because people have food on the plate. It's sacred. What makes anything holy? The presence of God makes something holy. And it's the Father's job to make sure that the family is relationally, spiritually uh, healthy in the home. You see that in Joseph. He puts her away, not out of embarrassment, though there seems to be some, some fear in his heart because Gabriel's got to come and remind him, but he puts her away as a sign of protection. I don't want people to think awful of her, evil of her. I don't want the rumor mill to go around. And we also learn that the right intention may still be the wrong decision. Right? Why does he put her away? To protect her, but Gabriel's got to come and correct it, doesn't he? 
Hey, no, don't put her away. That's not what Jesus is here for. Don't hide the fact that she's a virgin who's about to give birth. Bring her back out. Take her on publicly as your wife. Bring her out. People need to know. People need to hear what has taken place here. So sometimes a right intention may still be the wrong decision. We often might go, oh, that's not what I meant. Oh, that's not what I... Sometimes it can still be the wrong decision. He also goes and puts her away, maybe with some uh, spiritual ramifications, because we can also learn that we need to walk by faith and not by works or sight. Right? He let his fear of her, of her, um, how people will see her and respond to her, his fear of that he hides her away, he's walking by sight, he's walking by works, right? He's walking by what he sees and what he can do to protect her. But our job as fathers and husbands isn't to follow our own desires or our own directions, but to put God's directions first, right? He didn't want her to be a public example. But, G, uh, but Joseph still prayerfully considers That's why Gabriel comes. It's a response to the prayers of his heart. He's prayerfully considering, Lord, what do I do? Is she telling me the truth? How do I handle this? How do I get this fixed? How do I work on this? And Gabriel simply says, bring her home, right? Take her as part of, take her as your wife again, publicly. Number four, God desires, God wants holy, happy, and healthy families, right? So he has the right intention. He puts her away, but God's like, no, that's not what I want, right? God, I'm saying God, but it's through the direction of Gabriel. God directs Gabriel to tell him, no, bring her home. We've got to have complete families. Yes, that's true in the home. We need to have complete, holistic families who are holy, happy, and healthy. But right here, look around. Isn't this family right here this morning? This family right here, I mean, we sing it. Are we going to live it? Don't we sing? We're the family of God. Aren't we going to also live that those words? Yes. Amen. All right. We're going to live it. But then God wants what here? Holy, happy, healthy families in the church and in the home. And also another lesson that we're going to notice quite a bit is don't hide the truth. Right. He hides her. He puts her away in secret. Yes, he's got the right intention, but the G- Gabriel comes and says, no, don't hide her. Don't hide the truth. Adventists, do you hear that lesson? Don't hide the truth. Let it ring. Don't hide the truth. Interesting timeline here, because, you know, we get so used to the nativity pictures and scenes that we have outside of our homes or outside of churches that we see. And sometimes we forget that that's a, a nativity scene is usually an amalgamation of all the different stories put together as one. So here's a little timeline of the stories from Matthew and Luke and the desire of ages of, of the story. Number one, Gabriel announces the pregnancy to Mary. Then Joseph and Mary wed. Then Joseph sends her away, possibly to Elizabeth's house for three months. Matthew says he put her away. Luke says she's at Elizabeth's house. So you put those together. It seems that Mary was put, or Joseph sent Mary to Elizabeth's house because they lived out in the hills of Judea. A nice, quiet retreat an older couple, a respected couple, a loving couple, and Joseph still, you're not feeling like, I don't know if I should believe her. He marries her, it's honorable, but he sends her away somewhere for her to be taken care of and still loved while he prayerfully considers his next steps. Then Mary comes home and Gabriel says, take her again. Mary goes home to Nazareth. Not long later, they travel to Bethlehem And they find no place to stay. Sometimes we tell the story, we see the story in movies as if it was the same night. Like they arrive and then when they arrive to Bethlehem, she goes into labor. Seems that they were there for a couple weeks living in this manger. Can you imagine? Christ, God on earth. 
born in a stable where animals are kept? But doesn't it also make story to the rest, uh, make sense to the rest of the story of Jesus? What a humble beginning, if you can use that word, beginning of his life here on earth. What a humble way to be born. Unnoticed on earth, but praised in heaven. Amen? Unnoticed on earth, just three people in a stable, surrounded by animals, but praised in all of the heavens. And number seven, the shepherds do visit that night. The night when Jesus is born, the shepherds do arrive. And they are sent there by the angels. We'll talk more about their story here in a bit. Notice what uh, Desire of Ages says. Men know it not, but the tidings fill heaven with rejoicing. With a deeper And more tender interest, the holy beings from the world of light are drawn to the earth. The whole world is brighter for his presence. Wow. A baby born in a manger in a stable surrounded by donkeys. And yet the whole world was made brighter by his presence. Does the church have any different call today than to walk humbly and to be a light in the world around us? Amen? Same thing. Same passage that we are to take. Is the world brighter because of your presence? When you walk in a room, does the room light up? Are people happy to see you? Do you bring a piece of relief when you come into the presence of other people? Or do you bring a storm of stress? Are people happy to see you because they feel loved by you? Or are they happier to see you leave? Good questions, though. That, that I, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers going, well, you, 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 you. But I'm saying, ask yourself that question. Who am I when I walk in a room? Are people better off that I, that because I came? Are people better off because I spoke to them? Are people better off when I came to this place or that place? Or did I leave behind a dark cloud of misery and stress as I go? We need to be contagious. Amen? The good kind of contagious. We need to make sure that when we are with other people, whether we're at church, whether we're in a store, talking to the cashier that make, is making mistakes, or we're at work, or at community services, or at school, wherever we are, that people want to be like us. And then they'll really realize that it's not us that they're wanting to be like, that it's the power in us that they desire to be like. We need to spread that joy and that love and that light. We want the whole world to be brighter because of our presence. But of course, we know it's the light of Christ through us. Let's keep reading. Desire of Ages, page 44. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was another slide. But men may know it not. They don't know when they're talking to us. They may not know who it is. But we want them to know who it is that works in us. Right? Luke 2, verse 20. This is getting to the shepherd's story. Then the shepherds returned. This is after they meet Jesus. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. There you go. What we were just chatting about. Jesus came into this world. The world was brighter because of his presence. The uh, the shepherds come into his presence and then how do they leave? 
They leave as excited and as on fire, and they go home, and they start telling everyone around them what they'd heard and what they'd seen. It was contagious. The love and the light of God is to be contagious, so it spreads to us, and then we spread it to others. Amen. We live in a post-2020 world. We know what contagious means, right? We learned a lot how to not be contagious with germs, but now we can also come and learn how to be contagious with love, how to share that love around us. The shepherds, they caught the cold. They caught the disease of love. They caught it from Jesus, and they went out, and they shared it with everyone around them. Why is it, I mean, I know the, some of the reasons, but why is it that the winter time? has a spike in suicides, a spike in angst, a spike in stress. I know, it's because we're hanging out with our families and they stress us out. <laughs> right? It's also the change in weather and the you know, loss of hours of the sun. Anyone else feeling that at 6 o'clock at night now? Every night you feel like it's midnight? Yeah. Just want to go to sleep. You're like, oh, it's so late. I stayed up too late. You look at your clock and it's 7 o'clock. Right? So I know those things play a role, but it should be the opposite for the Christian. All year round, but especially in these days when people feel worse, when people feel down, when it's darker in the world, we are to be a brighter light in the darkness. People need to hear what we've heard and what we've seen, what we've experienced. We need to get that word out to them. And that is a part of the end of the story of the birth of Jesus. And you might be thinking, wait, isn't there another visit that night? No, the wise men did not visit that night. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Could have been up to two years later when they visited. But we often connect them with the birth of Jesus. So we'll chat about the wise men as well. Who were these wise men? We're told that there were two types of kings in the East. There were the prideful ones who were, who were oppressive to their people. And then there were humble ones who were students of the Hebrew Scriptures. These ones who came to visit Jesus were the ones who were adamantly and excitedly studying the Scriptures. They were descendants of Balaam who had given us a, a prophecy in numbers of the star that would rise in, in Israel. And so these wise men were looking for the sign, waiting for the star. And when they saw it rise, when they saw that star in the, their west, they knew something had happened in Israel. And they prepared themselves to travel to see the king who'd been born. Notice what Desire of Ages says about them. The Magi learned with joy that his coming was near. And that the whole world was to be filled with a knowledge of the glory of the Lord. These are, we're going to compare and contrast them here in a little bit. The shepherds versus the wise men from the east. But I want you to notice that they're experiencing the same thing, aren't they? Did the shepherds have joy at the presence of Jesus? You with me? Do the shepherds have joy? Do the wise men have joy? They learned with joy that his coming was near. They were excited that Jesus was coming soon. Hello. Did you hear that? Boy, oh boy, Adventist people need to be happy people. We are called to be a happy people. Amen. We are called, if this is, this is the first coming, we're talking about people who are proclaiming the second coming of Jesus, you and I. This is the first coming of Jesus, and we can learn from the model of the shepherds and the wise men who and, I mean, what our character is supposed to be, and they both have something in common. They were joyful people. Happy. I liked it. Bob didn't even know what I was going to preach about, but he got up here and just smiled at you awkwardly until you started to smile and wave back. Because that's what it should be about. Happy, joyful people proclaiming that Jesus is coming soon. Oh boy, they were excited to fill the world with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. These were Adventists, weren't they? 
proclaiming that Jesus was coming soon. Yes, they're pro proclaiming his first coming. But they're Adventists proclaiming that Jesus was coming soon, filling the world with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, the glory of the light of the Lord, and they were doing it joyfully. I'm going to step on some toes. I wasn't going to say this, but this thought just came in my mind. Nominating committee season is here, amen? Uh-oh. So when they call... Joyfully accept these things <laughs> and be a part of the team proclaiming that Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Amen? Joyfully, with joy, with joy. Let's keep reading. Matthew chapter 2. Read more about the, the wise men. Verse 1 and 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. So there's a little hint there. This is after, right? They, they, they've come after Jesus was born, but also what did they see? What was the catalyst? They saw the star shining, right? What was the star? You read that in Luke. It's when the shepherds are in the field the night Jesus is born. The angel appears in the brightness of the glory of God to proclaim to them that the Christ is born. And they see that hundreds of miles away. Why do you think they were looking at that spot at that moment? The Holy Spirit was moving on hearts outside of Israel at that same time. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, it's only Israel, Israel, Israel. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't think that way. He was moving upon hearts of people hundreds of miles outside of Israel to say, look in the sky to the west at this very moment, and they saw the shining star that they'd been waiting for. And then they came to a people who should have known the answers to their questions, right? Right? They've come to the heart of Israel. They've come to Jerusalem. We're here to worship him. Where is he? Show him to us. Bring us to him. We're here. We've got gifts. Show us where he is. But how does the king react? What do the people of Israel know? They're like, what are you talking about? Who was born where? They have no idea what's going on. The people who should have known. Listen, if that star was bright enough to be seen hundreds of miles away, it could have been seen in Jerusalem, which is just a few miles away from Bethlehem. But the people of God were not expecting Jesus. They were not happy. They were not joyful. They were not going about his work. They were not being Adventists. They were the chosen ones. They were the ones with the doctrines. They were the ones who had the truth written down before them. They're the ones who were practicing the worship of the religion. They were the ones killing the lambs, looking forward to Christ. They were the ones practicing the Sabbath. And they had no idea what was going on. They had no answers for the non-believer, for the community member. For the person outside of Israel, they had no answers when they were asked for answers. Are you ready to answer when people ask? Are you actively searching for the people who are coming to say, I need Jesus? I went, uh, I told the board this story already, but I went a few weeks ago to get a hot chocolate. Yeah, I drink hot chocolate. It was delicious. It was candy cane. It was good. <laughs> but I went to get a hot chocolate, and as I was paying for it, the, the young lady who was, who was making it started to ask me what I was doing and where, where I was doing that day and who I was. And I said, oh, I'm the pastor of that church down at the street here. Oh, what kind of church is that? Oh, it's Seventh-day Adventist. And while she's making my hot chocolate, she stops and she looks at me. You're Seventh-day Adventist? And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> what has someone done that I have to clean up? 
And she says, I just gave my heart to Jesus recently, and a friend of mine told me to check out the Sabbath. So I was Googling about the Sabbath, and I heard that the Seventh-day Adventists are one of the few people who are keeping the Sabbath. And so I asked God, introduce me to a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, hi. <laughs> I'm your answer to prayer today. Is the same God who was working in the wise men's hearts, who had led them to see the star, is that same God working today. He's still working today. And he's still leading people who are outside of the church to the church. And when they question, when they desire, are we ready to meet their needs? Do we have the answers they are looking for. The wise men came to Jerusalem with major important questions. You know what they're really saying is, take us to Jesus. Take us to him. Connect us with our Lord. We have been longing and searching for him. Connect us with our Savior, with our King, and with our priests. And the Adventists of the day, the ones who are supposed to be the Adventists of the day, the people of Israel, said, we have no idea what you're talking about. And what was that a result of? They weren't connected to Christ themselves. We must be grounded and connected to Christ, and then we are to joyfully proclaim him everywhere we go. Page 60 of Desire of Ages says this, To there the wise men's amazement, they find none who seem to have a knowledge of the newborn king. Their questions call forth no expressions of joy, but rather of surprise and not mingled with contempt. I missed the word there, obviously, as I typed. There was no excitement. It wasn't just the sign of the star in the sky. There were timeline prophecies of Daniel that were telling them that Christ was to be born, right? That Christ was to be born that year. They knew the location of where he was going to be born by the scriptures. But they weren't following the scriptures. They weren't studying the scriptures. And we know that because that's how Herod responds. He's got to call the priest and to tell him the scriptures. The Adventists in Jerusalem were not excited or ready for Jesus. I don't want that to be our story. I want us all, every single one of us, to be excited and ready for Jesus to come. And did you catch on the last slide? Also, again, that word, joy. You constantly see that story through Matthew, Luke, and the Desire of Ages in describing the birth of Jesus. Joy, 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 joy. Excitement, joy, happy, glory. You see it everywhere and everywhere. But, of course, there is good news in this story because amongst the people of the world, there was a remnant people who were ready and excited for Jesus. And you can't define it by racial lines. It wasn't just Israel. It wasn't just people outside of Israel. It was a mixed group who were ready for Jesus from both groups. The shepherds, excited and spreading the joy. Mary and Joseph, excited and spreading the joy. The wise men from the east, excited and spreading the news. A remnant people were found excited and ready for Jesus. The shepherds left their fields behind. You know, it tells us that in the story, that they were out there at night protecting their sheep. But then once they hear the news, it does not say in Luke, and then they went back to their sheep and took care of them, and then they went. No, it says they made haste and went to see Jesus immediately. The wise men, they came out of their heathenism. They came out of Babylon. 
and they came to Jesus. And what do they have in common? They were ready and excited to see Jesus. Luke adds this about the story from the shepherds. Then the angel said to them, that's the shepherds, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to who? So the tidings of great joy are not only for all the people in that day and age, but even for us today. Amen. Amen. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. manger. They heard the word of the Lord and they followed the sign given them. They were told, go to Bethlehem, find a baby in a manger. That's your king. No taking care of their sheep. Their work suddenly disappeared to them. Nothing could stop them from seeing their king. The affairs of this old, which are important, it was an important job to take care of the sheep, but nothing was more important than their service to Jesus. Nothing. When they were told, go now, they made haste and they left. You see, the religious traditions of the day had not prepared them with the truth. People in that day were expecting the Savior to be born of priests and of kings in the palace or in the sanctuary. And so the angel in mercy gave him a sign, you'll find him in a manger because that would have been the last place they would have looked if they had gone to find him. They would have gone anywhere else, and where would the leaders have sent them? Wasn't here, must be in Jerusalem. They would have run to Jerusalem. Wasn't here, must have been over there. And they would have run around because the religion of the day wasn't preparing them for Jesus. So it was in mercy that the angel said, where you'll find the baby in the manger. And imagine that Jesus chose not only a manger, not only to be a baby, But he also chose a time period when mankind had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. He didn't choose the antediluvian era to be born into, right? When people were stronger and smarter, less affected by the results of sin. He went 4,000 years later and was born into this world for you and I. Absolutely humble in every way. When, where, where. How? Humble, humble, humble. That's because he's a living illustration of the work of the church today. Humility and joy. Amen? Humility and joy. Keep reading. Verse 15 and 16. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us win. Now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When God calls, they came with haste. Let us go now. Too often it's the world we live in. Delay, 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 delay. Someday I'll give my heart to God. Someday I'll get baptized. Someday this. Someday I'll do that. Someday I'll step up more at the church. Someday this. Someday that. No. Today is today. Today's today. Don't delay any longer. Be like the shepherds. They were the ones excited for the Lord to come. They were looking and waiting. And when they got the news, they left it all behind. And they ran to see Jesus. Wow. Let's go back to the story of the uh, wise men. Matthew 2, 3, and 4. When Herod the king heard this, the news that the king had been born, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Maybe another lesson for us is don't just expect the pastor to know everything. I, so you know, I don't know everything. I don't. Don't just ask the pastor all the time. We have a living relationship with Jesus and we should be studying the Bible just as often. I have to study because I'm going to preach and teach. Don't you have to preach and teach as well? So you have to be studying as well. We've got Vespers. We've got a Wednesday night Bible study going on. We're studying Desire of Ages. Right after the holidays, we'll get our Tuesday mornings going again. We've got Bible studies being offered, and we all have our own personal Bibles as well to read and study. King Herod is troubled. Why is he troubled? He doesn't have to be troubled. He doesn't have to be ignorant. He didn't have to not know. He has a scripture. He has a scripture. He could have been reading himself. He's the king of God's people, and he's not reading about God or his people. He's troubled. He's troubled by the word that Jesus was coming soon. Wow. That shows you where his heart really was. There was no excitement. No joy. Because for him, the religious tradition was what? What was the Savior going to do? He was going to be the physical king of the Jews and save them from the Romans. So it's not just part of the story at the death of Jesus. It's part of the story at the birth of Jesus. They were expecting a physical Messiah to come and rule over them to get rid of the Romans. Even with that news, even though it was error, you'd think he'd be happy. But he wasn't. Because pride was so strong in his heart. He thought that meant he'd have to give up his kingship. His royalty. He'd have to give up his traditions. He'd have to give up who he was. How often are we like that? I don't want to stop doing that or stop doing that. or stop. I want to keep my life my way. A lot of lessons in here, stepping on our toes, isn't it? A lot of things that we could read from these stories and become stronger Christians in word and action and in personality. And so it continues, verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. You think Herod really wants to worship Jesus? No. We know the rest of his story. When he discovers or believes that Jesus, the Messiah, had been born, he sends the soldiers into Bethlehem to kill every boy under the age of two. By the way, another tidbit of why we think it's up to two years later, that's why he's slaying all children or boys under the age of two. The heart of God's people isn't always the heart of God. But it needs to be the heart of God. We must correct every flaw in our personality and in our character. Because when we don't, this is what sin does. This is the ultimate result of allowing sin in our lives. A complete rejection of Jesus. And when you're void of the Holy Spirit, when someone is void of the Holy Spirit, there's no end, no mercy line, there's no guideline to how far you will go to quiet your guilt. We'll see this at the end of time when the world is turning on Sabbath keepers, proclaiming Christ is coming soon. A death decree will go out. Why? Because they're trying to quiet the guilt of their heart. But this isn't the path of the wise men. How did they feel? When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Amen? See it again? What does rejoice mean? Do they feel joy? And so Matthew repeats himself. They rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. The Greek word, you'll appreciate this, you'll love this. The Greek word for great is mega. 
We still use that phrase today. So how did the Adventists, the real remnant of God, how did they feel? They didn't just have joy. They had mega joy. Mega joy. Great joy. Expounding joy. It was just exceeding their heart. It was a flowing over fountain of joy when they saw the star. You see the difference in the two sides? Those who are not walking with Christ are feeling that stress and angst and trouble and misery of this world. Those walking with Jesus, excited for Jesus, are filled with joy. And it's flowing out of them. And they're all telling the news. The shepherds tell the news. The wise men are telling the news. They're all actively and excitedly serving the message and mission of God. But I want you to think about the two sides of the remnant. You have the shepherds, young men of Israel. You have the wise men, men of the east. You have the shepherds of the line of Isaac. You have the wise men of the line of Ishmael. Two sides who to this very day are still fighting over things. But you've got two sides who aren't focused on the things of this world, who are focused on the Christ, and they're working together in this story. The shepherds come and see Christ, and they're telling people. The wise men have come to see Christ, and they're telling people. Often, we put God on a side. God is on this side or that side. God's on my side. God's on Israel's side. God's on America's side. God's on this side. God's on that side. Do you know that that is complete error and and, and heresy of the Bible? God is not on someone's side. God is asking who is on my side. We can go to the Bible to discover that. In fact, it's, the, it's a, one of the best stories we can to discover that. God has instructed Joshua and Israel to go into Canaan and to take the land, right? God has told them, you're going to go into the promised land. You're going to take the land. The Canaanites are going to either leave or you will kill them. And so we will define that as God is on the side of Israel. But at one point, Jesus appears to Joshua. And Joshua's taken back. He's aghast. Like he doesn't know what's going on. I want you to notice what question he asks Jesus. Joshua 5, 13. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man, it was Christ, stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us? Or for our adversary, adversaries, right? Do you catch this question? Joshua comes and goes, whose side are you on? Well, Jesus has told them to go in and take the land. So obviously Jesus is on Joshua's side. Obviously then the very next verse is going to say, it's going to be Jesus going, I'm on your side. What does he say? Verse 14. So he, Jesus said what? What's that word? No. Are you on our side or their side? And does he say, does he pick a side? He just says, no. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? Did Joshua get the point? He literally has instructions from God, go in and take the land. Jericho, he's at Jericho. Hello, what's going to happen to Jericho? Right? And so we think as we read these stories, Jesus was on the side of Israel because they took Jericho. Right before they take it, Joshua's at Jericho. He sees Jesus and says, whose side are you on, mine or theirs? And Jesus says, no. And then Joshua gets the point. And he, he's admitting his question, what does my Lord say to his servant? He's saying, I get it. You're not on my side, but I'm choosing to be on your side. You're the king. And so we make God as if he's choosing sides. No, he's asking the world, whose side are you going to be on? 
And this is the inspiration later when, when Joshua comes to the people of Israel and he says, listen, there's the, 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 the gods of Baal and the gods of this and the gods of these people. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He doesn't say, God's on our side and choose my side if you want to live. He says, I'm on the Lord's side. Me and my house will serve the Lord. I don't know if you've been in town recently over the last few weeks, but right at the corner of 4th and 16th, there's a, people, there's a group of mostly young people with bullhorns and big Palestinian flags, and they're screaming and shouting, free Palestine and this and that. They're screaming and screaming and screaming. And every time I've driven by, they're not out there all the time, but when they're out there and when I drive by when they're out there, Every single time, there's other people standing right in front of their face and screaming back at them. And I've rolled my window down. And they're screaming for Israel. And they're screaming for Palestine. Because they're all, they're all, dis, they're all what are they arguing about? Whose side God is on, right? What, are they, what does Islam believe? God is on our side. And what does America and Israel believe? God is on our side. That's not the question. The question is, whose side are we on? And when we listen and obey and we choose to be on the side of the Lord, we will walk with great joy in this world. We won't have to be in these screaming matches on the side of the street. We'll be able to just preach that Jesus has come and he's coming again. The people who are truly following God in the stories of the birth of Christ are the ones who are preaching with great joy. The ones who are claiming God's on my side or this and that, they're the ones who are troubled and fearful and calling for death. Right? Find us the boy, we'll worship him. But really he's making plans to kill the boy. War is not the desire of God. In fact, you get that from this story, from the birth of Jesus. What, is, what does the angel say to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest and on earth, what everyone? Peace and goodwill toward men. What's the role of the church? To bring peace and goodwill toward men. To bring peace to the world. To show that in our actions, in our words, in our responses, in our love, goodwill toward people. John would write about this, 1 John 4, 9 through 11. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the punishment or the, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So you have John repeating the words of the angel. Peace, goodwill toward men. John's reflecting on why Jesus came into this world. And he's telling us he came into this world to share love with us. He manifested love, the love of God into this world. The light was brighter in his presence. Amen? And that's the role of the church today. To be a bright light of love to the world around us. So, when the wise men arrive, Matthew 2.11, they arrive to Jesus. So, when they had come into the house, notice they're not in a manger anymore, now they're in a house in Bethlehem. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They brought their gifts to Jesus. Amen? Hey, did I tell you nominating committee session is, is nominating committee is going? Bring your gifts to Jesus. Bring your gifts. So what gifts do we have? 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Put them to good use. Exercise them with great joy in the ministry of God's, of God's love out there in the community. They brought these three gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, they all have purpose and reason. The gold was their gift to their king. The frankincense, incense is used in the sanctuary. It was their gift to their priest. And myrrh was a resin that was used as a perfume for the dead. It's a part of the burial and the preparation of the body for burial. So they brought the myrrh as a gift to their savior. Isn't that a strange gift to give a child? It's like, can you imagine giving a newborn baby a, a coffin? Hey, you're going to need this someday, kid. Right? It would be weird and strange, but they brought something that someone would need when they die. It was their acceptance. This is our Savior. He will die for our sins. Where'd they learn that? From the Hebrew Scriptures. In fact, myrrh is an important part of the story of Joseph. Notice this, uh, the original, the first Joseph back in Genesis. They sat down to eat a meal, then they lifted their eyes and looked. This is his brothers after they've thrown him in the pit. There was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. This was providential. Because Joseph was a type of Christ. He'd been thrown in the pit, but why was he sent to Egypt? Because God was going to save the world, right? God was going to save his brothers, his family, and the world by the works of Joseph in Egypt. And at the beginning of his story, when he's first thrown into the pit, he's put there with myrrh. He was going to die in Egypt. He was going to be humble. He was going to be a servant. Just as Christ came into this world to die for his brothers or to give his life for the salvation of the world. Of course, we know that's what God did in Egypt. But as Joseph says this many years later to his brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. They gave the gold, the frankincense, the myrrh. They gave it to Christ in recognition. He was their king, their priest, and their savior. Jesus Christ is our king. He is our priest. He is our savior. He is three in one. Amen? He came to this world as our king, our priest, and our savior. He was the embodiment of three in one. Another lesson from the birth of Jesus of the Godhead. The Trinity, Father, Son, Spirit. Jesus was the embodiment of the three in heaven in one. The three in one. Colossians says this, 2.9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. More and more and more, speaking of Adventists in these days, more and more Adventists are turning away from the Godhead. Turning away, turning away, turning away. Just had a church up in the uh, Pacific Northwest shut down this year. Because it was preaching the, uh, anti-Trinitarian stuff, so the conference voted to shut the church down. More and more, but no, it is everywhere throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, you find three in one. You know, with the main important lesson of the whole story of Jesus is summed up in this verse here. When they're told what to name him, behold the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. God came down. Heaven stooped down to this world. And it was unnoticed to those who weren't paying attention. But to those who were paying attention, the signs of the times were noticed. Amen? God's coming again. Heaven's going to stoop down again one more time, and he's coming soon. And we are called to be a people who are involved, who are excited, who love the Lord, 
who have goodwill towards other people around us, a people of joy and a people of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Thank you so much that he was willing, that you were willing for him to come into this world. It began in such a humble way. Father, let that be something we ponder and meditate upon this year as we, at this time of year as we close up 2023. Help each of us, Lord, to spend time asking, how can I be more humble? How can I be more joyful? What are the things that are strangling my joy, that are distracting me? Where is the, 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 the Herod-like tendencies in my heart? Help us to be more like those shepherds, to be more like those wise men, to be united together as family, but united by the gospel, united in joy, united in humility. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.